So my son always likes to help me with the joke for Wednesdays, and he knows that I get nervous sometimes. And so today he asked me, um, you yeah, know, how you feeling about it? I said, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of nervous, like I always am. And he said, mom, all you have to do is deliver the joke, just like a boxer, just be a boxer. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, just deliver a heck of a punchline. There you go. I will say he made that one up himself. So I have to give him props for that. Yeah, that's good. It's a punchline. Good morning, Daily Huddlers. Welcome to Wednesday, where we talk about everything, relationships and communication. And we are going to get started this morning with a few questions to get us all present in the room. I'm going to start with Stacy, who I see just popped on. Hey, I think Stacy knows the answer to this question. What time is it? The time is now. The only time we have full mastery of. Mm, that's so true. Thank you so much. That's right. And now I am going to go to my good friend, Sorrel. Sorrel, how are you and who are you going to hug today? Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. I am the way I say I am. And I am ecstatic, loving, and powerful. Ooh. And I'm going to hug my wife today. Mm, wonderful. I love that. She's lucky. Thank you, Sorrel. And now I am going to ask our final one to our guest, Colonel Tom Montgomery, because I know he knows the answer. Where are you and what are you grateful for today? I am right here. And I am grateful for friends and, and learning, you know, especially every Wednesday morning. Hmm. Good. Well, we're excited to learn from you today. So awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Wednesday. We talk everything relationships and communication. Our um, My dear friend and co-host Tara is traveling today, but we are passionate about this because we know that communication builds better relationships, better families, friends, and businesses. So here we go. I have the great honor of introducing someone who is very dear to me. Tom Montgomery to answer the question, what is the key to leading a successful team? So let me tell you a little bit about Tom before we get started. Um, I had to truncate his bio because he's so impressive, but let me give it a shot. <laughs> so <laughs> that too. No. So Tom is a colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserves. He was commissioned to active duty in September of 95. He is a career-long armor officer commanding tank units at the platoon, company, and battalion levels. His overseas deployments include Iraq and Jordan. He's a trained foreign force advisor, helping advise and develop militaries from 45 countries. Tom's a graduate of the U.S. Army War College and currently serves as a senior staff officer at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, with the 2nd Marine Division, whose primary focus for the Marine Corps is Eastern Europe. Tom's approach to leading teams centers on creating an environment with processes that enable success at the individual member level, thereby enabling the team to best achieve its purpose. He is currently a reservist, lives in Charlotte, has two wonderful children, and works in risk management and process design for a large U.S. bank. And I adore him. Welcome, Tom. <laughs> yeah, so this is exciting. So the key to leading... A successful team. So you've been in the military for a really long time, for 27 years, and there's you've done a lot and could say a lot about this, but we talked about this and wanted to focus on one area specifically. When you were the commander of the tank battalion, um, when I found this out, I was like, wow, that is, um, wow, incredi overwhelming and inc incredibly impressive. But when you were commanded the tank battalion, you had a team of 1,100 people that were under you. Tell us a little bit about what you found was the key to leading a successful team. Because when you were in that role, you had a very efficient, proficient team, very skilled with no injuries. Correct? 
Yes. Right. So yes. tell us a little bit about that, about your time and, and answer for us the question where you're going to go with this. Like what is in, in a single like word or bottom line, what is the key to leading a successful team? When I answer the question directly, it's creating an atmosphere and then having all your processes designed with the individual in mind. So if you can find a way to connect at the individual level where they are, then you can help them develop. You can guide them toward the collective vision of where you're mm -hmm. trying to go, you know, as an overall all unit. Uh, you know, when they have problems, mistakes, you're much better able to uh, help guide them back. And when they're succeeding, you know, you're, you're there to in, encourage and, and to continue to, to push forward. And then collectively in the aggregate, then the whole team is so much better off. Yeah, that's great. So focusing on the individual and the relationships, tell us about a time that when that was really clear for you. Okay, sure. Yeah, early on in that tank battalion uh, two-year uh, role uh, with 1,100 people, we were spread across the country. So I had to was very mindful of, of certain things, particularly live fire training, just because how inherently dangerous it was. And so one of our tank companies out in Boise was doing a week long uh, tank gunnery and it's extensive day night, live fire, a lot of fatigue, a lot of stress, but it's very critical to getting to a proficiency level should we then be called to go overseas. But the focus has got to be at that individual level, how each person's doing, especially from a safety perspective. So something like that, I'd always keep my phone with me at night. And, um, you know, there were only a couple of things that would have us just immediately stop what we were doing and examine like what's going on. So if somebody got hurt or if we had an accidental discharge of a weapon. In the first case, people are most important uh, element of, of the unit. Right? And we never want to have anybody get hurt because it's almost always preventable. And secondly, if you have an accidental discharge of a weapon, there's a whole combination of factors that have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So around 1 a.m. I was sound asleep and my phone rang and I woke up and I knew I'm like, this is not good. No one calls at this hour for good news. And it was that on-site uh, senior leader called me up and said, hey, sir, we got a problem down on the range. Uh, we've had two tanks maneuvering, you know, through their uh, engagements. Uh, and the one tank got disoriented uh, and uh, and then accidentally discharged its uh, heavy machine gun, a long burst at the other tank. Oh, wow. And so we immediately stopped firing, put them all off the line. And I said, okay, all right. Uh, well, thanks for calling me, but tell me more. You know, what happened? And tell me about that tank commander, because it was that tank commander responsible for the vehicle, and he's the one who discharged the weapon. Mm -hmm. And so then learning more about the tank commander, 22-year-old young corporal, first time, you know, going down range, but he had gone through all the preparatory training and passed it all. So we were comfortable, give him a chance. So I will, well, tell me, how's he reacting to this? Well, sir, he's really upset with himself, very remorseful, uh, you know, but we had to pull him off the range, make the statement to everybody else that this is just not acceptable. You know, there's right. zero tolerance for this kind of negligence. So, all right. So well, what do you want to do, Captain? Well, sir, I, you know, I want to give him some more training, but I think he can do this. So, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about what you want. Okay, all right, that's good. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, all right, that, ca that captain has a good grasp of what's going on. Mm -hmm. He knows that individual. And I told him, I said, hey, all right, proceed. Yeah, I'll put him back on the range tomorrow. And have him go out and give me an update tomorrow. Tell me how it goes. But the wow. last thing, captain, I want you to do, tell that young corporal, tell him that he has your and my confidence when he goes back out there. Oh, wow. And so I hung up the phone. I got a, I got a message the next day. And uh, that, that, that young corporal, 22 year old, uh, he <laughs> commanded his crew. They successfully passed all the engagements, no more safety incidents. They were ecstatic reaching that level of proficiency. And I thought to myself, good, good. Here's somebody who wants to do well. He just made some mistakes. I got to think it's probably unusual for somebody to have that big of a mistake or error and then to put them back out there. It sounds like you had a choice point at that moment. Like, do we punish him, take him off, make an example of him, or do we invest in him and put him back out there? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Because you're trying to balance, you know, what's the effect on the overall unit, what people are seeing? Because for mm -hmm. me, as, as the overall leader, I'm trying to espouse, focus on safety, the individuals, you know, care for them. And, and here we have someone 
uh, you know, for that, just a few feet further to the left and, and that burst of heavy machine gun fire, it would have been lethal to right. wow. you know, the crew members next door. But, but then you think, well, what about the individual? What was going on for him? But maybe there's a way we can balance this and then pulling him off the extra training and then encouraging him to succeed. Is how we struck that balance. And then I pulled up with the staff afterwards and said, all right, well, what are we doing when we have new tank commanders? What else can we do to get them more comfortable in the vehicle? What do you think the impact was of doing that, of, of putting him back out there and telling him both on him and the team that, hey, we have confidence in you that you can do this? All right. Yeah, it's very hard to measure, but it was certainly very positive. Mm -hmm. You know, just for, for me, the pressure on me as the unit leader is, okay, don't get anybody hurt, but oh, by the way, Montgomery, your status level of all your crews gets reported to the Pentagon, and you get one time a year to qualify tank crews, and if you don't qualify crews, your readiness level is down here, and that's not what we require of you. So the Marine wow. Corps needs this reserve battalion, which had all the reserve armor in mm -hmm. it. You've got to be up at a proficiency level because we need you. Right. So it was a risk for you putting yourself on the line to really invest in him. So it sounds like that. I mean, that is your philosophy when you build teams this way and focusing on the individual person. And say a little bit more about what you found to be true in that when you do that, either in this case or others. Sure. Yeah. So if we've got that focus on the individual and then we've got people then aligned to what's the collective purpose of the unit? Mm -hmm. And then if everybody's operating in what I feel like the appropriate way for how they treat each other, mm -hmm. you know, and then I'm also asking of them to have commitment into the organization. And conversely, mm -hmm. I'm telling them, here's my commitment to you, my focus on you individually. Mm -hmm. Then if we can achieve that, that, that focus on the individual in those ways, then we get, we get the buy-in of, of the individual. Mm -hmm. You know, we get you know, the empowerment, you know, decision-making you know, down where people are best positioned, you know, to make good decisions. You know, we get to tap their creativity. It's amazing, you know, the ideas. And I, I more or less would have done what that captain had done on the range, but the way he articulated it so clearly, like mm -hmm. he's best positioned to know what's going on. And I, that's, that's, that's awesome. Go with it. Yeah. It's his plan. He owns it. He's got the buy-in. But I'm telling him, I'm, I'm right here with you. So if anything goes wrong, it's on me. And that's just the way it is. But if it goes well, that's that's because of you, Captain, and the corporal. Right. Well, it sounds like you empowered him to do that as well. That's an interesting word to use, empowerment, how you really give them what they need. Because you're not just, um, what's the right word? Like giving them the appreciation accolades, trying to build them up. You're empowering them to do, to find their own creativity and their own creative solutions. Yes, yeah, and then for me as the leader, if I've set those conditions and if I've got you know the processes in place, focus at the individual level, then what it does for me, it frees me up. Mm. I've got space to observe, to encourage, and and anticipate. I can look ahead and go, okay, I've, here are some problems that could arise. You know, you can't always predict uh, what what comes up, but when things surprise you, well, then you're much better positioned to respond, mm -hmm. either you personally or then you know, shift resources over to that situation to help. I love what you're saying because I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs who listen and that is a classic problem. I had it as an entrepreneur. I coach a lot of folks where they get so in the weeds that they don't have that space. They're either micromanaging or doing too much or not, they don't have the right team to offload. And I think what you said is super important that actually by empowering the individual, it gives you space to have your own creativity and do to do what you're really best at. Yeah, you know, and that incident, I it's, it was also fortunate because it was early on in the two years. Mm. So then you see an incident like that, and it really shows you, okay, if we've got this right level of focus, and particularly if they're high profile events, and and how we then, you know, lean into it and, and mm. learn oh my gosh, look, look what we're doing. And then for me, you know, that much more learning for me individually as to, I began to appreciate that very rarely did I have to make a decision quickly when something was coming up. I, the question that I would always ask is, okay, well, when does a decision have to get made? And usually with some amount of time. And mm -hmm. then for me, it was just at that point, okay, let's make sure the right people are pulled in. You know, subject matter experts help to give us 
good views. If it's personnel related, let's get the senior enlisted, particularly the sergeant major, who's got you know, way more insight than I do as to effects on the individual. Let's factor all this in. And then I can really tap the creativity because I'm giving people decision space. I'm giving them the time. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, it's like, all right, well, just tell me, what do you think? Okay, I might, you know, push back here or there, but otherwise we'd almost always come to a really good outcome. Mm-hmm. And rarely yes. was it my, yeah, my decision. It's like, all right. Well, that's what I'm hearing more and more. Like you're not in your self place, you know, you're not in this sort of, here's what I want to do, or here's what I think needs to happen. I don't even know if you've used the word I, it's, you're looking at the team, you're looking at what's needed. um, And that a lot, like I said, it allows you to step back and have space to be able to see, and you probably have much more peripheral vision, you know, about what's going on around you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That, that observing and encouraging and you know, the anticipation, a lot of times where you're just asking like, well, what, how can I help this along? And I would tell those subordinate leaders, you know, especially before any big, you know, going overseas, you know, big exercise, you know, sitting near the Russian border or over near China or, you know, or, you know, an extended deployment. The question for me then was always, well, how can I help you best? I would ask them directly, but then I would keep asking myself that that question. And sometimes it was just simply demonstrating to them that I care about them. Like mm-hmm. there were times where the Sergeant Major and I, we would travel around the country and try to be on site, you know, for the very challenge. Oops. We lost him. Now we get to get real creative. Let's give him one more sec and see. Ooh he'll come back yeah i am curious though because i have so many questions that i could keep going all day but i'm curious if there are any questions that have come up that we can like start to talk about so when he gets back we uh i have a question that came up for me Catherine, as we're waiting for uh tom in the military there's this rigid hierarchy Mm -hmm. people come into the military um not just for that reason, but they're trained by that. Mm -hmm. So is it easier to actually deal with a team in that environment than it is outside where people are, I mean, they they come with that expectation, I guess. Welcome back, Tom. Yeah, all right, thank you. Great. We, well, and I was just asking for some questions while we waited for you to come back and Sorrel actually had a really good one um, that I don't wanna lose and then we can segue back to where we were. We left you. Um, Sorrel, do you want to ask that again for Tom? Uh, yeah, I'll ask it. And, you know, Tom, in the military, there was this rigid hierarchy. The You're the colonel, there's the corporal, there's, you know, there's that yeah. chain of command. And it's respected in such a way that uh, we're in a corporation or in a business, rarely do we use the word order. In the military, there's such a thing as soldier, you've got an order. <laughs> Uh, does that structure make it easier to manage a team? Well, in some ways it does, but I think you're also highlighting, Sorrel, there's a real vulnerability that should you lean on that too much, you don't get the empowerment, you don't get the buy-in. So through the military, especially through recruit training, you've conditioned people to respond to orders and they can do that for some amount of time, but eventually they're not, they're going to get disillusioned but you're going to be so far from tapping what they can contribute individually. And therefore collectively the team will fall well short of what it could do. Mm-hmm. If you're not taking that time up front, let's, here's our unifying purpose. How am I empowering? Now there are points in time, especially I had this overseas in my combat deployments in Iraq and, and Jordan. Yeah. There are times where, Hey, right now, this is what we're doing. But afterwards then reflecting and, and recognizing, Hey, I really need to, pull everybody back in so they understand why did we do that and let's get back to where we need to be as far as you know I guide you know they have the decision space to decide and act and I back them and and, and that's the thing and that's where it breaks down I you know Catherine I can I go there yeah yeah this question of you know like well we can talk this way and it and it sounds good I probably makes sense to you as we describe this but then the question becomes well well, so many teams fall well short of that. Well, why do they fall well short of it? Well, there's a consistency in the actual execution that's so important. 
So it's that if you say how you're going to operate and you say how you're going to focus on the individual, but especially in those high visible points of stress, if you don't act consistent with what you've said, it all breaks down and people get disillusioned. And, and I was advised years ago, you know, talking about how teams come together in leadership and in this phrase of, you know, you're, you're, you're forming and you're getting better and better. You're going up the proficiency curve and you've got camaraderie and you, you're really feeling like you're part of something. But then you have some of those episodes where you're inconsistent and then you land in what we call the sweet spot of mediocrity. And then the unit just floats along mm. so well short of, of where it could be. So that, that warning always in the back of my head of, all right, let's, we don't want to be mediocre. Mm. Sweet spot of mediocrity. Yeah, <laughs> people get hurt and, yeah, and we're not doing what, you know, contribute, you know, yeah. what's being asked of us. Yeah. That's great. And I hadn't really thought of that, that you could use it as it could be easier as Sorrell's, you know, asking, and it could be something to lean on where you're, you as an individual are not actually stepping into your full potential or empowering those underneath you because you've got a structure to lean on yeah yeah structure lean on, or or if you go one step further the, pe the people that didn't lean on that too much are that much more vulnerable to you know some of the perks that might go with the role and you think well yeah i i deserve this mm. like well no <laughs> i mean it's it's absolutely verboten you know especially for an officer to do certain things like not share the burden or things like you know make a demonstration of i will always eat last if I'm the senior person here, I will eat less. I will show you that I care enough about you that if we don't have enough food, you will get fed and I will go hungry. Mm. And then when we're out in the field, like the Sergeant Major and I, let's go one step further. Let's serve the food. That way we can look in their eyes and ask them how they're doing and build that much more of a connection at the individual level. Yeah. That's great. That's something that I've really noticed about you and, and just being around you and then other people as well that... Yeah, it doesn't diminish the level of servant leadership. The higher you go, it actually grows versus what you've described. Um, or you can watch it in other areas. Somebody gets more senior in an organization or in politics or who knows what, or even, you know, well, anyway, any, any, any situation. And like you said, they become more, perhaps more entitled or they can, but I've watched the opposite happen with you and others at your level. Well, I've had some really good mentors along the way and in the schooling, particularly the work house I just finished up. We spent so much of that two-year program talking about strategic leader competencies, concepts like strategic empathy. Back to, back to that question of, you know, how, what are our processes? What is our approach and how is it affecting at the individual level? Mm. Yeah, I love that. This is great. Well, um, I want to open it up to questions and see. That was great. Sorrel started us off with that. And um, what are some other questions that um, anyone might have? And Tom, I actually don't remember where we were when you left off. So if you remember that, I'm going to come back to that because I want to finish oh, yeah, sure. that thread as well. Sure. Yeah, Stan. Looks like Stan has a question. Well, you know, Tom, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine, and everybody in there. Um, it really is about leadership. It, it's really more about, I mean, I know you got to have the strategy and you got to know how to, you know, to be operationally, you know, learn to be operationally competent in things that have to be done, right? But at your, at your level, you know, and, and at your level of, of, uh, uh, of, of leadership, is it more knowing really how to work up with people and really getting the best out of people than it really is all the other competencies? It's a great question. It's the people and then it's the processes. It, the processes for how we train, develop, educate, how we run disciplinary proceedings. Because look, everybody in the career has made mistakes. Mm -hmm. But what are our processes? How are we running those how are they designed so that at the individual level we're, we're connecting with with people you know i tell you some of my greatest satisfaction in, in my in my military careers people who made mistakes along the way and then you run a disciplinary proceeding in a way that's that's actually objective and then you spend the back end on all right well look i here's your here's your punishment but let's shift to how do we bring you back how do we improve you and then back to the consistency, then I make a point to follow back up 
you know, call on that leadership. When I go back out there, pull that young Marine aside. Hey, how are you doing? Just to show that you care and get them back engaged. Yeah. So I, you know, it, it, again, it's back to the individual focus in these different ways. And then by doing so that I'm demonstrating to everybody in the unit, I expect the other leaders to have that, that same level of commitment to the individual. Yeah, that's great. I love what you're saying. I hadn't heard it like that before, um, as you described it, but it's focusing on the individual, developing them and the processes help you be consistent because you know exactly what you're doing with each individual and where you're taking them. That's great. And I believe I saw Peter raise his hand. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Tom. Great presentation. Um, I'm an admirer. So oh, thank you, thank you. this is um, the, the, the three takeaways that I have, but uh, I, I'm going to press you a little more. Um, design the processes with the person's welfare in mind is primarily the main thing. Uh, people are more important than things. That, that's obvious. And um, express your confidence in the individual. You have to build it in them, what it is that you're trying to achieve. What are the tips? If you were to encapsulate everything, what would be the one thing in terms of the leadership process that you would share here? Um, so I, I, I think Peter, you're just asking me just to reflect back and say it even more succinctly, you know, the mm -hmm. leadership focus here. Um, it, you know, I keep saying the individual focus, but, but for me, it just keeps coming back to, well, how am I demonstrating that to people that I have that individual care like for me, what am I doing? You know, how am I making decisions? How am I engaging? You know, and there are certain overt things that you can do. That if you just, if you've got a little freedom of, of, of thinking, even creativity, I, you know, when I lost my connection there for a moment, I was given some examples of, you know, sleeping on the ground, you know, it's 112 degrees. You know, why, you shake your boots out because the scorpions crawl in them at night. Or, or we, you know, go out to Yakima, Washington in February and the blizzard rolls in. We're right there with all the Marines. I mean, those overt acts of, I care about you as an individual, and this is what I'm gonna do to demonstrate that. Right, look, and I didn't create that. I, I had some phenomenal leaders along the way. And so then when you get up to a certain level, you think, all right, well, this is how it all comes together. And then you feel you've got a responsibility to then you know, live by that and impart that on the organization. Servant leadership. Exactly. I got exactly. it. Yeah, thank I you. It. Thank you, Peter. And living by example. Okay. We've got a couple more questions. Thanks, Peter. Sorrell. Uh, yeah, Tom, uh, you talked about the team member that failed and you gave them another chance. Uh, are there times in your experience when actually uh, cutting a team member was the best thing to do for the team and also the best thing to demonstrate that commitment to the individual? Tell us about sure. those instances. Yeah, that's a great question, Sorrel, because I mean, there are, you know, there's a number of Marines every year who get processed out of the Marine Corps. You know, they're just not meeting standards or they've got a pattern of behavior that is inconsistent with what we require of people. So you've tried to engage, you've tried to encourage and steer back. And you're exactly right there. You know, when I was in battalion command, we processed out a number of people because at some point you realize it's just overall too corrosive to the unit. And it's best for that individual to move on. But, but the view remains that as long as you're on this team all the way up until that last day, we still care about you. And, and to never let anyone back off of that care. And then, you know, ultimately behind it, I heard this years ago before I you know, got to be more senior. Look, if people come in in the military and you're responsible for them, we have a duty to care for them. And when they come in, whatever we can do to help them be a better citizen when they go back out in the civilian world. So even those individuals who got processed out, they may need a period of time to adjust. But in nearly all cases, in, 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 in some meaningful ways, they were better individuals if we did it right. Yeah. Wow. It's like seeing those humans, not just as a Marine or having a role. It's their Yeah, humans. or you messed up and now we're going to forget about you. You're like, yeah. no, we're not. Wow. Joy Sonia. 
That's great. Thanks, Sorrel. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so this is such a timely conversation. This morning, Stacy and I, we were praying and I prayed about my nonprofit because I'm like, okay, I'm not sure where to go right now. So this is so timely. So thank you again for this conversation. So um, I, I follow and read a lot of John Maxwell, you know, who talks about tapping into um, the talents of your people. And so with my nonprofit, um, when people are coming, a lot of times they're like, you know, uh, well, wh whatever you need me to do. And I found myself working on things and I feel like I'm still overworking, even though um, I have people um, who are there. So with me, and, and I found myself going back to, okay, this is what we're doing. How do I change that now and go to, and move from that back to tapping into their strengths and, you know, and their talents and the things that they want to do. So how do I make that change? Yeah, a, a great question. I, and you do have the ability as a leader to reset, which is essentially what you're asking. Maybe you've been in charge for a while and you're realizing that, hey, we need a different approach here. Uh, the, I had been in charge for about four months in Tank Battalion, and I finally published my, my leader philosophy, my, my command philosophy. And it articulated much more clearly, what's our overall purpose? What do I ask each of you individually? And what's my commitment to you? And then when I rolled it out, then it was a heavy focus on communicating this so everyone heard it. It was posted in all the spaces, you know, in, in all of our eight <laughs> locations around the country. And then my focus in the consistent application of that philosophy. So we've shifted, you know, a new, uh, a much more clear focus and then that consistent execution. So you can certainly pivot in the way that you're asking if you just do it deliberately in those ways. I love that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Sonia, we're over just a couple minutes. That's fantastic. Um, I love the fact that you can pivot and it's similar to your process statement with people. It's like you do it, you do it intentionally, you let everybody know and you communicate really clearly. So um, Tom, two seconds, just give us your final words for us to walk away with. All right. Well, yeah, you know, in any team environment, you know, especially something like the military, it, it's, you know, it's a people business. It, it, it's, it's so much a people business. And so therefore, it's all about the relationship at the individual level. I love it. All about relationship. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone. We are going to close out with our seven tenets, as we always do, given us by Patty Dabrowski. Love. Love people, love the humans that you come into contact with. Laugh out loud. I make sure to say that I often forget it. It's the one thing I need to focus on most. Laugh, stress less, eat more plants, get your sleep. It will help you stress less. Give, give of your servant leadership. Give to your people, help develop them. And last but not least, move that body. Thank you, everybody. We will see you tomorrow on the Daily Huddle. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Catherine. Thank, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank thank you. you Sorrell. Right. Thank right. you, Stan. Thanks, Colonel. <laughs> Number five. Colonel Tom.